Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. How's everyone feeling this morning? So before lunch, blood sugar's low, the candy's worn out. You feeling good? <laughs> good. So in the big scheme of investment advisors, of which I'm one, I am relatively unusual in that I spent 20 years in the digital marketing and advertising world. So my practice was to take money out of people's pockets and pressing all the buttons that make people feel great. And, you know, it's like, you know, it's a, how the economy works. We're a capitalist society. For better or worse, this is how it works. So somewhat becoming an investment advisor is a little penance for those 20 years of uh, taking money out of people's pockets. But I think there is a much bigger thought. And, you know, our mission with Goldbean is to bring new investors into the marketplace. And, you know, there is a huge divide in the US economy and globally in terms of just people's understanding of money and people's understanding of how to grow their money. And let's take some wise words from uh, Albert Einstein, if you haven't seen this quote before. It's quite a brilliant one. You know, there's uh, two sorts of people in the world. They have people who understand compound interest and they benefit from it, and the people who don't understand compound interest pay it. One of the biggest issues with the financial services world is that for a very long time, everyone's been chasing the same pile of money. I've got quantum computing, I've got AI, I've got an awesome robot, give me your pile. And that has been the message that the rest of the world hears, which is, well, I don't have a pile, so it sucks for me. So it's, you know, it's not for me, growth isn't for me. And basically, it's not just, it's not for me, you have now a set of people who have basically a sinkhole of money. I don't have a pile, I have a sinkhole. And everybody knows the numbers. There's a trillion dollars now in credit card debt, a trillion dollars in student debt, a trillion dollars in auto loan. These are real numbers, but there's also half a trillion dollars spent every year on getting money out of your pocket, which is also what I did. I apologize. So there is a real opportunity to engage people in a different way. And this isn't just about, you know, Adirondack chair retirement. This is much more so about getting people to engage with their consumption in a very different way and engage with their money in a de very different way. If anyone didn't see this article, it was about two months ago and in the Atlantic, it was absolutely amazing. And there was a very honest first person um, account of this journalist who's a widely, widely published author basically saying he is one of the 47% of Americans who cannot make a $400 emergency payment without going deeper into debt or without selling something. And if you think just for a second of the enormous loss opportunity of people who can't take a risk, people who can't lean in, who, people who don't want to put their hand up at work for a new job because they've got to get their next paycheck because they have to make their bills. If half the population is struggling and not being able to live up to their, huge, their own potential, what does that actually mean for the future of the economy? And I love these conferences so much because we live in the land of possibility and all the things that may be. And what I look at is like, who are they going to be for? If someone is way behind the bell curve, like where are they going to be able to get into their flying drone car of the future? <laughs> So we have found in our audience three very distinct profiles of people, the underinvested, the uninvested, and basically people like Pam who are very underserved. And underserved not in a way that traditional banks think of them, but really underserved in confidence and tools that can help them move from where they are to move forward. So Pam is like 47% of America, or every second household, with $15,000 in credit card debt. And to service that debt costs about $2,000 a year. And if you're on an average income, that is a huge proportion of your income going to just service a credit card debt. So Pam has made her way, and she's got credit cards, and she's got debits and checking accounts, but she hasn't really explored the full breadth of what you know, the financial services industry could bring to her. And now there's many new players stepping in, saying, I can help you out, Pam, and I can consolidate this debt. And then you also have the payday loan lenders coming in, saying, I can help you out. But the real missing link here with Pam is that she hadn't been sort of grown in a culture of, you can grow your money, right? Pam is one of the many people that will spend her money before she has it, and then has to pay much more for it in the future. So very much underserved in terms of her confidence and in terms of her tool set. 
Maureen is a classic millennial. She's earning $55,000 a year. She never uses cash. She is generating a lot of data, and she is the poster child for pretty much every advertiser that targets females. So there's a lot of people trying to get money out of Pam's pocket, not so many uh, out of Maureen's pocket, not so many helping her keep it in there. But so she knows a lot about companies and products. And I think this is a core truth that we are all raised from birth as consumers. And if you have small children, you will know they start to recognize brands at a very, very young age. So you can tell someone who isn't familiar with investing, you should buy an index fund or an ETF or a mutual fund, and they will shut down. And you say, tell me the difference between Nike and Under Armour. What do you think about Target versus Amazon? You can have a conversation, and you can start the conversation building on an enormous base of knowledge that they already have. So in this case, people like Maureen will come to us because they're looking for experience. They just want to get started and get some experience. And then we get clients like Benny, and this is actually one of, again, a tr core truth of the retail brokerage industry, is that many people will start a brokerage account. They'll deposit some money in there, they may buy a few things, and then they just don't know what to do. And now with the fiduciary rule, there's even more you know, sort of protection around what can be told to Benny. So as a registered advisor, we actually do a lot of work with people who have just had basically idle accounts for a very long time. And so Benny, in the past, it would be someone who had, you know, he'd make a few trades, his curiosity would die on the vine, he would keep his brokerage account small, and he just lost 20 years of potential growth. So a way that we think about getting people engaged in the market is much more from a linear path. You work really hard for your money, you give it to these companies, they work really hard for their shareholders, it's a linear flow of money for your whole life if you're not in the market. We explain to even the most resistant investors that even just if you can get in in a little way, some of that money can start flowing back to you. But it's not just all on the consumer side. Why aren't companies looking at engaging with their clients as well? They're spending half a trillion dollars every year to talk to them, what else can they do? So we have this thought and our core, the core basis of our business is that when people can look at their data and see where their money is going and see the impact of their money on the economy, it rewires those little dopamine. I love shoes, I would love to buy more shoes, but I also know that I made $1,000 by prioritizing money last year into that company, so maybe I'll do that instead. And it's not about spending less money, it's about just bringing this growth mindset. I mean, we're seeing amazing things in our data in terms of loyalty. Even if someone only has a practice portfolio, the way that our platform works is that people can share their transaction history with us. And we use some of those companies as a hook. The Well, obviously, they need to be good investments, but as a hook to build a portfolio for them, their very first portfolio. We start to see loyalty shifting within categories. You buy Target, you stop spending so much at Walmart. It's a pretty amazing thing, and it's incredibly interesting for companies themselves. Um, we're also seeing, you know, because people give us access to their, um, to their transaction history, we're seeing what happens over time. So, and interestingly enough, there is a Venmo line, if anyone hasn't heard of that, people under 35 will share their data, people over 35 generally will not. So, it's a, um, a really amazing way to see how people who traditionally were just seen as consumers, they're not even mass affluent, they, tend really, they aren't targeted by bigger institutions, just to see them getting their baby steps, putting a direct deposit into a trading account, buying into the portfolio once a month. It's a pretty great feeling. So how we see this shift from, let's just look at people as consumers and extract value out of them, into how do we actually start to look at people as an asset that companies should be investing in. Again, they're investing half a trillion dollars in talking at them, but what can work the other way? So the actual core idea of investing does need redefining. It still is very much a visual, you know, it's an old white dude, sorry to all the old white dudes in the room, but it is very much an old, an older concept of that's something that my dad did, and that's something that, you know, the other, you know, it's for the others. But even more important is a, set, a sense of how do we hardwire growth into people's mindset? Earn the money, save some money, spend your money. Like, why isn't grow your money the ne very next part of that? And that's a huge part of what we're educating for. But then I think there's an even bigger opportunity in terms of enabling participation. So what can companies themselves do? And I don't know if anyone saw this news earlier this week, but John Laguerre of um, T-Mobile, 
it's an amazing promotion. But if all it does is to get more people to think of, hell yeah, I'm a part owner, and yes, I'm going to get, I now own a share of T-Mobile, and I'm going to get more clients to T-Mobile because I get more shares, fantastic. Because then you've got people who weren't participating, participating. So when you think of all the trillions I've been talking about, credit card debt, loans, advertising spend, the exponential opportunity of redeploying and rethinking those trillions, what could it mean for, you know, for our society and for the future? And especially if you can unlock that potential of people who are stressed about money and not living up to their own human potential, what would that mean in terms of less financial stress, more money in the economy? What we believe is that's the key to abundance. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.